I call the February 26, 2024 meeting of the Legislative Commission on Pensions and Retirement to order. A quorum is present. The first item on our agenda is approval of the meeting minutes. We have meeting minutes from February 19, 2024. Is there a motion to approve the meeting minutes? So moved. Uh, Representative Nelson moves approval of the February 19, 2024 meeting minutes. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed say nay. The motion prevails and the minutes are adopted. Uh, Madam Chair, uh, I wasn't at the meeting, so I guess I can't <laughs> those oh, minutes. I'm sorry. We will take that back then. I'll so, move it. Thank you. Senator Pappas moves that the approval of the February 19th, 2024 meeting uh, minutes. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed say nay. The motion does prevail and the minutes are adopted. And before we begin to our first uh, item on the agenda, I just wanted to say uh, welcome to Senator Bonnie Westland. She has joined the commission, taking over uh, Senator uh, Aaron Murphy's <coughs> position. As we all know, Senator Murphy uh, got a big promotion. And so uh, we're glad to have Senator Westland uh, on uh, the commission with us. Thank you. Uh, our next item is to approve the actuarial assumptions for the fire fi three firefighter relief associations. Uh, I have, I will have our nonpartisan staff explain the motion and the need for it. Uh, Executive Director Susan Lecheski, if you could please explain. Good morning, thank you. Thank you, Chair Herr. The motions in your meeting materials respond to requests from the relief associations for the volunteer firefighters in the fire departments of Brooklyn Center, <laughs> Minnetonka, and Chaska. These relief associations provide retirement benefits that are both lump sum and annuity. It's the annuity part of that that requires them to come to you for approval of changes and assumptions. Um, as in the valuations for the statewide pension plans discussed at last week's meeting, the plan actuary needs to use these actuarial assumptions to perform the valuation. Each of the three relief associations revised their vesting schedule after the law was amended to permit shorter vesting schedules. Both Bro Brooklyn Center and Chaska went from full vesting at 20 years to 15 years Minnetonka went from full vesting at 20 years to 10 years. The shorter vesting schedules mean that more firefighters will be able to retire with full retirement benefits. The actuary has recommended that the assumption for re retirement rates be adjusted to reflect that. <coughs> Your materials include a motion for each relief association to which is attached the letter from an officer of the release, relief association requesting commission action. I've included below the motion the excerpt from the statute that requires that the uh, relief association or its actuaries submit the request to the commission. If approved, the new assumptions can take effect as requested. If not, they take effect one year later. Chair, okay. that's my explanation. Thank you, Director Lincheski. We do have a testifier to speak to the need for this motion as well. So if uh, uh, Chris Pierce, board president, Chaska Fire Department Relief Association, if you are ready, please come to the testifier's table and begin your testimony. Good morning, Madam Chair. Thank you for having me. And if you could just please identify yourself for the record um, if you get. Sorry. I'm Christopher Pierce. I am the relief president for the Chaska Fire Department Relief Association. Thank you. And you can I, proceed. I am here, um, recommended to be here by our actuarial to uh, request approval of the letters received. Okay. Is that the end of your testimony? It is. Okay. Do we have any? <laughs> very short and sweet. Do we have any questions for our testifier? Any discussions? Uh, Senator Pappas. Thank you, Madam Chair, um, and thank you for being here today. Uh, this has really been a long time coming. I, mean, I think we've been hearing about this vesting issue for a while and about retention, and so I'd be very happy to support it today. Thank you. Any further discussion? Seeing no further discussion, I will move the LCPR M3, M4, and M5 motions to approve these actuarial assumption changes for the Firefighter Relief Association. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed say nay. The motion prevails and the motion is approved. We will now turn to the bills on our agenda, and uh, we will be considering resulting legislation from the State Auditors Firefighter, uh, State Auditors Volunteer Fire Relief Association Working Group. Representative Cha and Senator Pappas, will you please move the language? <clears throat> and I'll let you all get settled before you move the language. <laughs> Maybe we should stay back. Okay. Maybe we should stay in our seats. We have more room for you guys. No, everybody hang out. Yeah, be in the middle. Come on. Yeah. 
come closer. Let's check in. All right, am I up? Um, I think I'm going to start. I just want to get on the screens. Senator Pappas. Oh. Yeah, Madam Chair, um, I don't know if do you accept the motion first or do we do that at the end? I, yes, if we could have either you or uh, Representative Cha uh, move the language. I move uh, House File 3636 and SF 3574 be recommended to pass and be incorporated into the 2004 Ominous um, Pension and Retirement Bill. Thank you, Representative Cha. Uh, would you like to offer opening comments on the bill, either one of you, Senator Cha or Representative? Uh, Representative Chow or Senator Pappas. <laughs> um, sorry, Madam Chair, I don't know if Representative Chow has opening comments. I do as well, so I'll start. Um, for nearly two decades, the Fire Relief Association Working Group, convened by the State Auditor's Office, who has joined us this morning, has served as a vital forum for discussion. The platform has allowed them to tackle challenges specific to fire relief associations with a collective voice, creating space and capacity for meaningful change. The fire chiefs asked for a comprehensive review of the definitions in the fire relief statute, and I'm pleased to announce that, that this bill will move, fo move that forward with legislation that's important to them. It's essential to acknowledge the dedication of the members of the fire relief working group who generously volunteer their time and expertise. Their efforts deserve our thanks and appreciation. And just a reminder, all of their provisions are uh, presented to us uh, by a unanimous vote. And Madam Chair, then I would like to turn it over to State Auditor Julie Blaha. Thank you, uh, Senator Pappas. Auditor Blaha, if you could introduce yourself and then proceed. Thank you, uh, Chair Her, members of the LCPR. Uh, as they're working on, there's some really fabulous animation in this. And so when it comes up, we're just going to start back over. But until uh, we get that set up or get it in the right, uh, maybe plug it around. Um, all right, well, with that, let's start. I, if you have, you have this available to you, too. Okay. So, and also, if you're watching at home, it should also be in there as well. So just a reminder that um, relief associations are government entities that are also nonprofits. They are governed by state law and bylaws, uh, and they provide retirement benefits to over 15,000 uh, volunteer and paid on-call firefighters. All right, are we, are we up? Nope. Oh, because I think Serious, this is going to be really cute, though, when you see it. Um, and, uh, and, and remember, the uh, Fire Relief Association is run by elected local boards, right? They file annual reports with us. Um, they are the primary source of non-investment revenue for a local entity here. Now, this group was established in 2004 by then-Auditor Anderson, um, and it's been, it was here basically to consider and vet uh, legislative uh, changes in a technical nature. You know, uh, we want to make sure we're bringing things here with a lot of unanimity so that it can be relatively non-controversial uh, to go through. Members are relief associations, fire chiefs, city and town officials. We try to get a really wide variety of stakeholders. In addition, we do also try <coughs> to balance the, um, we do try to balance uh, greater Minnesota and uh, rural Minnesota as well to get as comprehensive a voice as we can. Um, so with that, uh, I could certainly go on, and I'd love to, but I want to thank the team that worked on this. These are, uh, again, people who are, you know, they're, they're volunteering, they're coming in. These are technical people. They're, they're the people in the, in the weeds, in the gears, and uh, they just do a great job every year really doing some, trudging through some really complicated material. And if you ever want to see it, we do house all of our meetings online at the Office of State Auditor's YouTube page, so hop on in. And uh, you may really enjoy that. Now, while I turn this over, if I could, to our um, OSA Pension Division Director, Rose Hennessy Allen, and then I'm going to play with these courts, because uh, I bet I can do, figure this out. Um, oh. Auditor Blah has sounds like the cord is uh, well, shredded. Well, well, yeah, yeah, so we're not able to think, connect. But <laughs> Oh, OK. If you do, that's wonderful. And uh, Rose, if you could identify yourself, and if you want to begin, or if you want to try to wait until Auditor Blaha maybe can. No, no, you just start because. Okay. We're just gonna... <laughs> Thank you, Madam Chair. Rose Hennessy Allen, Pension Director at the Office of the State Auditor. Um, I'll just really briefly walk through the articles in the bill. Um, Deputy Director Kelly did such a great job with the staff summary, so I won't go into too much detail. Uh, Article 1 um, clarifies municipal approval requirements uh, for benefit level and bylaw changes. 
Uh, relief associations have and have had for decades authority to increase benefit levels without municipal ratification under very limited circumstances um, and have to meet um, um, certain thresholds in order to do that. And so this bill clarifies what those thresholds are that must be met in order to um, do a benefit level increase or, or bylaw change without municipal ratification. <coughs> Article 2 clarifies requirements if a relief association is involuntarily dissolved. Um, so there's a, a process in statute that defines dissolution requirements if a relief association closes up and terminates its pension plan. Um, and so this bill clarifies that uh, the benefit calculation requirements and reporting obligations still apply if it's an involuntary dissolution. Um, the article also um, clarifies supplemental benefits um, that are payable when uh, um, when a retire when a relief association dissolves, and that those supplemental benefits um, are not subject to the age 50 requirement if the um, distribution is related to a death or disability of a firefighter. Um, Article 3 clarifies um, that an officer must certify on behalf of the Board of Trustees um, that the Board reviewed its annual investment report card. Um, the investment report card is something that our office prepares annually and, and um, provides to relief associations and municipalities, and it shows their investment performance for the year and multi-year returns, and also returns uh, available through the State Board of Investment and other benchmarks. And currently, the statute requires that the Board of Trustees certify that they've reviewed it. And this clarification is that one, one trustee of the board can certify that on behalf of the board to our office. Um, Article 4 clarifies the period of time that investment returns must be allocated to deferred members of the defined contribution plans. Um, the bill sets a default um, allocation method if the local bylaws do not specify something um, more specific. And the final article of the bill are the definitions that were mentioned. So the bill adds definitions of volunteer, paid on call, part-time, and full-time firefighter um, to the relief association statutes and then updates um, the chapters um, that govern relief association benefit provisions to re reference those new definitions. Um, and with that. Um, Auditor Baja. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair Hearn, members of the commission. Um, I also, uh, wh whoops, I just, am I up? No, I'm not up here. Uh, I just lost what I was thinking. Never mind. I think that we are good. <laughs> and it looks like you have two testifiers here today yes, as well. We so I will go ahead and call up Chief Eric Bullen, president of the Minnesota State Fire Chiefs Association. Oh, looks like it's up now. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Eric Bowen, City of Albertville Fire Chief. I'm the president of the Minnesota State Fire Chief Association. Uh, previously, I was the State Chief Association liaison to the working group for four years. Um, I'm here for support of the, uh, the, the Relief Association Working Group Bill and here to answer any questions that may come up. Thank you. Thank you, Chief. Our next testifier is Aaron Johnston, Treasurer, Coon Rapids Fire Relief Association. Good morning, Chair Here, Thank you very much. Uh, Aaron Johnston, Assistant Fire Chief, City of Coon Rapids Fire Department. I'm the treasurer for the Coon Rapids Fire Department Relief Association. I'm also here to support uh, this bill um, and here to answer any questions. I'm very nervous. Thank you. Don't be nervous. <laughs> Auditor Baja. Thank you. I have my one final thought. Uh, and I do want to thank you again, Chair Her members of the committee. Every single one of you took time to meet with our team. And I really appreciate this is such complicated material. And the fact that you were all willing to take time one on one and walk through it with us is was a huge help. We really appreciate your questions it really did help form. Um, it de definitely informs our work. Thank you. Thank you. And are there any, well, the screen is up now, auditors, so oh. I don't know if maybe you still want to connect, but. Well, it's a different screen. Uh, okay. Somebody else's screen. Okay. Well, why don't we go ahead as we're working on, continue to work on this if we have many member questions uh, or comments. <coughs> uh, Senator Rasmussen. Thank you, Madam Chair. And a question for Auditor Blaha or Ms. Uh, Hennessy Allen. Um, for Article 3, when we're looking at the investment report cards, has, has every relief um, that you review certified that they 
have reviewed those investment report cards, or are there any folks that are not certifying that they've reviewed or had their board of trustees review the report card? Um, <clears throat> Uh, uh, Ms. Hennessy. Um, thank you, and thank you, Senator Rasmussen. Um, every relief association has certified to our office that they've reviewed those report cards. There is a, a question on the annual financial reporting form that gets filed with us annually that asks if the certification has been done or not. Um, if the answer to that question is no, um, then there is a kind of a flag that comes up within the form that informs them of the requirement, um, and then we have um, you know, links to be able to view the report card. Um, so that is something that our an analysts um, check when they review that form for every relief association and then do follow up. If, if a relief association were to certify that no, they hadn't, um, then we would follow up with that. Um, Auditor Blaha. Chair Her and Senator Rasmussen. It has been a very popular uh, set of changes, though, to be clear. It is usually something that's not, it's easy to certify because people usually grab it, read it right away, and especially with the expansions that we've added and you've, uh, that you all added. Uh, it's, it's even more uh, top of mind and interesting to people. So thank you. Senator Rasmussen. Thank you, Madam Chair, and I, and I appreciate the Office of the State Auditor putting those investment report cards together and, and glad to hear that. Um, <clears throat> Boards are reviewing them. Um, one other question I had is, you know, much of the bill is kind of parsing out what it means to be a volunteer paid on call, the kind of nomenclature around um, volunteer relief associations. And so, uh, Madam Chair, my question is, is this the, the is this the last time we're going to be kind of talking about these different terms and the demarcation from a pension policy, or is this something that we're going to be talking about again? Um, and was also wondering if you could speak to maybe some of the rationale for you know, breaking apart some of these terms and, and what problems it, it fixes. I could start. Uh, Auditor Blaha. Uh, Chair Hurst, Senator Rasmussen, I think I'll start on this. Yes, you're going to get a chance to talk about this. And in fact, this is one of those things where people ask, someone had to start. Someone need to take the first bite of this apple. So uh, we started with our section. So while you may not see things in our section, I believe that there are, are, there's interest in looking at this um, in other spaces uh, in, in statute. And, but I think that our, our, our fire chiefs are actually a little better versed on that, where they want to go with that. Chief Bowen. Thank you, Chair Herr. Senator Rasmussen, um, I can't speak going forward for the working group because I will no longer be on it, unfortunately, because I have new roles that I raised my hand for one day. Um, from the state chief's side, I think it purely represents the current state of what the fire service is in Minnesota. Um, Part-time firefighters are relatively recent. Um, there's discussions at city council meetings or relief associations, what benefits can we afford these? So we've, we've really tried to just get a snapshot of what the state looks like um, and then tie those to base, I mean, just the retirement relief association benefits that they're afforded. Um, the city of Otsego right now is looking at starting a new fire department and their chief, he's from outside the state, right? So he's got questions on what do different roles, what does the city then assume as the employer? I think that's the simplest question in my, or the answer in my mind that I've got for you. Any follow-up, Senator Rasmussen? All right, any other further discussion? Uh, Representative O'Driscoll. Thank you, Madam Chair. <clears throat> Excuse me, and um, appreciate the opportunity to visit with all of you this morning, and, and once again, um, my condolences to you and to the members of the first responder community for the tragic loss that we had, uh, in Burnsville, as well as the state of Minnesota have experienced. And so our thoughts and prayers are with all of you. Um, I wanted to just um, kind of broaden the conversation a little bit because these fire relief associations um, serve municipalities and town government. And I'm just wondering if there's any comment or any feedback or any um, avenues into the conversation from the cities that you support and where their, their input might be on, on the recommendations that are here today as well. Auditor Blaha. Thank you, Chair Her. Thank you, Representative O'Driscoll. Yes, we have people, we have uh, city uh, and local government uh, officials on our on the working group. And in fact, they've been extremely helpful. We start getting in the weeds, they know how to navigate. So it is actually the people who not only are, are using the system, but the people who are administering the system are absolutely an integral part of this working group right from the beginning. 
Follow up, Representative Driscoll. Thank you, Madam Chair. And then just kind of also wondering, what's the expected number or rate of participation do we see changing as a result of this? Um, we have a, a number of how many more participants will be eligible and where we might be at in, in, in stability of our firefighting um, resources at the local level. Because we, we do have a problem recruiting, particularly in the paper service area, and I'm always concerned a little bit about do these accelerate people's um, leaving the industry and then do we have the ability to to backfill as well auditor Blaha uh, representative her uh, I mean chair her representative Adriscoll I'm not sure if that's in so much in this bill this might be we are know if we're talking about maybe the next bill on the agenda uh, but as far as these are really technical so I don't think these necessarily uh, change anything in specific other than just improve the running of the of the um, of the entity uh, itself and of the fund. Um, but I'm actually quite interested in the answer to your question uh, when that next bill comes up. <laughs> Representative Odrisco. Well, then, Madam Auditor, you're on notice for the next bill. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Any further discussion? If there's no further member discussion, uh, then uh, Representative Chan, Senator Pappas, please, if you have any uh, closing comments, or in, and then to renew your motion. Well, Assistant Chief Johnson, don't be nervous, because I'm nervous also. <laughs> <laughs> and with that, I'd like to renew my motion to recommend HF 3636. And SF3574 to pass and be incorporated into the Omnis Pension and Retirement Bill. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed signify by saying nay. The motion prevails and House File 3636 and Senate File 3574 is recommended for passage and will be included in the Omnibus Pension and Retirement Bill. Thank you. Uh, we will now turn to a presentation for the Public Employees Retirement Association on the development of their statewide volunteer firefighter plan. For those members who were here with us in Fergus Fall, this presentation will look familiar. However, there are a few updates as we develop further legislation to codify elements of this plan. Uh, Director Anderson, please uh, welcome to the commission and introduce yourself for the record and then proceed with your testimony. Thank you, Madam Chair. Good morning, Commission members. I'm Doug Anderson, Executive Director of the Public Employees Retirement Association. I just want to thank you all for your work uh, last year to secure some funding uh, and to allocate it towards the statewide volunteer firefighter incentive plan. I also want to thank Senator Rasmussen for his input on the process. Uh, this uh, $5 million investment, I think, has been so far very well received by the groups that we've been speaking with about possibly joining the SVF. I also think it's going to go a bit further than the $5 million uh, that goes into the fund for these uh, volunteers in that uh, from the feedback we're getting, I think this is going to result in some administrative cost savings for these groups that will join us. Um, we're having challenges finding auditors, uh, some higher expenses, so we think this will save some money uh, for them, which uh, will go for their benefits. I think there's potential for higher returns when they rely on the SBI for the process for some of them. And uh, as part of a requirement for when they join, they are required to have a benefit level uh, cost study so they get a chance to take an analysis to see if there's potential to raise a benefit level. So I think the $5 million may actually go further than the $5 million that was assigned. Uh, the statewide volunteer fire plan was established in 2010. It is voluntary for uh, fire departments to join. Uh, and while we talk, call it the statewide volunteer uh, plan, it's really a collection of plans. So each plan is uh, independent uh, in the sense that it has its own assets, its own liabilities. They set their own benefit levels. Um, they're, they're backed by uh, governing bodies that are required to make a contribution if needed. So they're very, uh, really kind of work independently. What's common is that PARA does the administration and the investments are done at the State Board of Investment and there's no investment choice. There's one fund that they uh, invest in and, and that's it, no choice. Uh, so been pretty steady growth. There has not been, uh, in, in the, since inception, there has not been any real concentrated effort to try to grow the plan. 
Para has provided education to any group that has asked. So this is really the first uh, incentive plan that uh, is intended to try to grow the plan, and uh, we, we think it's going to be pretty successful. Uh, one thing I would note is that in, in uh, 2018, uh, PARA has an SVF advisory board. So the PARA board does not necessarily have volunteer firefighter expertise. So there, in 2010, when the SVF was established, it came with an advisory board uh, of people that work, uh, either volunteers or work with volunteers, uh, to help guide the PARA board. In 2018, that advisory board made a suggestion that said, if departments knew that they could leave after joining PARA, that might remove an obstacle to them joining. So we had heard before that they were concerned about joining because you join and what if you don't like it, you can't leave. Well, in 2018 it was established that if you don't like it, you can leave and no one has left. So a pretty good record of the plan continuing to grow steadily uh, without any department choosing to leave uh, since. Uh, Give a little sense of, of what has attracted some plans to the SVF program. Uh, the primary reason we have heard is that it's, particularly with smaller plans, we hear of a volunteer who's retiring, who volunteered to do the administration, they don't want to do it anymore and they can't find anyone to do it. So ease of administration is what has brought some plans uh, over to PARA. And we've had a higher percentage of the smaller plans. So this is just uh, showing, uh, you know, for example, on the bottom, that's the number of members in the plan. So on the far left column, the very small plans that have one to nine members, uh, eight of those had joined the para SVF, five had not at this point. So just a sense that a little, little bit more likely that the, the smaller size plans so far have been attracted, but we have had plans of all sizes uh, joining. So when the in incentive plan was uh, created, uh, PARA was given some discretion as to how to create how that would be distributed. And we are grateful for that. And we did engage with our advisory board, had many sessions over many months uh, with uh, some help from the LCPR who helped us with a nice survey that uh, was informative for us. And this is a, a list of the considerations that the advisory board had in mind uh, in creating the incentive plan formula. Uh, first, it was uh, considered that the success of the program is primarily going to be based on the number of plans that join, not the number of members. In other words, just kind of gearing it a little bit towards, more towards the smaller plans, but not exclusively so. Uh, also considered that it's, it's assumed that the $5 million is going to be the only amount payable. We're not assuming it's going to happen again. So we had to recognize that and consider that there's probably going to, there needed to be an element of first come, first serve. It's not an unlimited amount of consider funds. Consider that, it's, it's assumed that the five, <laughs> the third item, everyone else is hearing that too, right? I hope it's not just my, okay. Uh, the third item is the incentive money. Uh, it was intended to be used for benefits. Uh, that, that's the hope that we really don't want the groups to just use this to build their surplus. <laughs> these plans tended to, these plans are really well, well funded. There's, uh, uh, the, the average plan is about 150% funded. So the goal isn't necessarily that, uh, to use this funding just to build a higher surplus. You know, the goal is to have it go get to the volunteers. Uh, however, uh, the advisory group didn't suggest that the, the incentive amount be tied to that. Because there was some consideration, well, maybe there should be an extra incentive to raise the benefit level, which would reduce the funding ratio. Uh, but they did not take that direction because they felt the, the incentive should really be focused on just plans, getting them to join SVF with a further goal and a broader goal, not just to new entrants, but to all the current plans to be how, how to work on the issue of overfunding and how to bring that uh, down so that more money gets to the volunteers. So that's a bigger issue to address in the future. It wasn't tied to the incentive plan program. 
Uh, item four was just to say that it didn't want to have different amounts for different groups that joined at different times, so wanted to make sure the formula was the same for every group that joined. Uh, the advisory board talked from the beginning about having a fixed amount per plan plus an amount per member. Uh, and then lastly, um, there's no kind of minimum participation period uh, or it can't be rescinded. This, this came from discussion about, well, what if a group joins, gets the incentive, chooses to leave, and there too the advisory board felt like well, we're not going to try to create difficult rules to prevent that. So um, it, we tried to keep it as simple uh, as possible. Uh, so there were some steps with the advisory board to, to really do some uh, analysis here about, well, how do you figure out how to distribute $5 million? Uh, how do you target the right groups? How do you get the right amount? So the, the way we looked at it was to consider the wide range of benefit levels that exist between the departments. Uh, there are departments that have a benefit level of as low as $250 per year of service, and some are over 10,000 per year of service. So this is a lump sum plan. So for example, if, if the, the benefit level is $1,000, what that means is that the volunteer will get $1,000 per year of service payable at age 50. So there are some large plans that give 10,000 or more a year. There are some small plans that give 1,000 or less per year. So the, the chart here was just trying to say, well, how far does this, certain, this formula go? Uh, you know, starting with 10,000 per plan plus 1,000 per active member. So an example of this is that if a 20 member plan has a benefit level of $250 per year, uh, they would get an incentive amount of $30,000, which would provide six years of, of benefit level, six years of credit for every member for that group at that benefit level. But if you look at how the formula works for a group that has 90 members who get $10,000 a year, it's a bigger incentive amount, it's $100,000, but that wouldn't even fund one year of benefit level for that, that number of members. So it's just trying to show that this formula can go a long way for some groups, and it doesn't go very far for other groups. And, and we went through this exercise because we, we needed to try to figure out the best guess is, well, who's gonna join? How, how do we know? Um, and, and we need to make certain assumptions, and we put them into these three groups. Said, well, the, the groups in which the incentive goes a long way uh, are more likely to join. The groups where the incentive doesn't go very far are less likely to join. Uh, so there's a lot of information on this page, and I'm not going to go through it all, but it is something that the advisory board looked at. Because we didn't just start with the 10,000 per plan plus 1,000 per member. We looked at different formulas. We looked at, well, what happens if it's 5,000 per plan plus 2,000 per member? Um, and, and just try, kept kind of experimenting until, we, until the advisory board reached a place where they thought this is the right place to be. Uh, and kind of working through this, it's believed that this incentive plan can probably go as far as getting 100 to 125 plans on board. Uh, with a reasonable amount that's not too high and not, not too low. Uh, from there, there need to be a little bit of work to kind of figure out, well, what happens if demand is very high and the, the incentive is then on a first-come, first-served uh, first basis? So uh, kind of work through the process for that. Uh, and then also, well, what if the incentive is still around after the end of the year? And at that point, kind of developed a, a process that would be, well, then the incentive is going to be raised a little bit for the next year, but also applied retroactively so that it meets that advisory board criteria that all groups would get the same amount. Uh, so I'm not sure, uh, you know, how, how many plans that we'll get. The interest is very high. Uh, we are... 
have been out talking to groups, uh, and the interest level is very high on this. We will have a couple of webinars uh, that we'll have uh, March 12th and March 18th, and we're advertising those out to the interested groups. Uh, we also are talking about the defined contribution plan, too, that, the, that will be added to uh, the SCF in 2025. Uh, and, and there's some interest from the certain departments about that as well. And it's specifically the, those departments that have very high funding ratios, uh, and some are 200% or more. The reason they often do that is to make sure they are avoiding any contribution from the governing body. Mm -hmm. So there's a contribution that comes from fire state aid, it kind of covers the contribution, but in some places there's a, a, a real strong fear, <laughs> I think, of having any contribution come back to the governing body. So that's why they're so conservative in keeping high funding, funding levels. Well, we talk about the defined contribution approach as being a potential option there because the excess assets can get allocated to the firefighters and the contribution is defined as the fire state aid amount, ensuring that the governing body will not have a contribution. So there's, there's kind of a win-win to that approach that is, uh, I think, intriguing to some groups. Well, we're also making it clear, because this is a big step for Paris administration, adding 100 plans, that a group can join and essentially keep their same plan in, in the year they join and then consider, consider converting in, in the future to a defined contribution. They don't have to do it all at once. Uh, so that's, that's the incentive plan and the approach, and uh, we're uh, looking forward to seeing how many, how many we'll get this coming year. So I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Executive Director Doug Anderson. Uh, and um, we do, uh, we actually, I'm gonna open it up now for member questions. Is there, are there any questions? Senator Rasmussen. Thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, thank you, Mr. Anderson, for all your work and your team's work on this. Um, I, I think it's important, especially on a day when we have uh, firefighters from across the state here at the Capitol, just to say thank you for your service. Um, and from the, a lot of the volunteer firefighters I talked to, the reason they got into uh, serving their community was to protect their community, provide public safety. It wasn't necessarily to run a pension fund. And, but that's what we ask a lot of our local communities to do, and especially as um, we have uh, constraints, especially on smaller uh, departments, there are challenges on finding an auditor uh, to you know, be able to review their relief association. I think there's a lot of benefits um, from a program like this. And additionally, one of the things that I've seen locally in my area, we've seen across the state, is as relief associations are going through this process of joining the SVF, uh, the vast majority have substantial increases in their benefit levels, which means more money going to volunteer firefighters because they're able to get um, the guidance and feedback from the para team to know that you don't have to be 200% funded and that that's actually a problem too, just like being underfunded, that you're basically retaining too much of the dollars and not putting enough towards the benefits that um, firefighters receive. One thing I just wanted to point out is, as a commission, one of the fixes we'll have to be making this year is to allow the para-SVF to have that defined contribution option through legislation, because right now there are current um, defined contribution plans that cannot convert to para-SVF, and then if they were to go into SVF, they wouldn't be able to select that as an option, so we need to make sure we have parity there, and I think the commission will address that later on. Um, Madam Chair, I guess a question for Mr. Anderson would be, beyond the webinars, what other types of outreach uh, plans do you have uh, as this plan gets rolled out? Mr. Anderson. Uh, Madam Chair, Senator Rasmussen. Uh, well, there is some uh, outreach through the advisory board membership, uh, which has connected us with some fire chief association, uh, and there's potential um, conferences that they have that we're willing to go out and talk to that group. The advisory board has been out talking about that uh, to that group. Uh, I think that's the, the primary. Uh, I think continued uh, word of mouth uh, is good. We are think potentially reaching a tipping point with 235 plans in this now. 
that's a third of those in the state. Uh, I do hear when we go out, they talk about, they're asking about their neighboring communities too. Are they involved with this? And increasingly that's a, a number that's talking about it. Uh, so those are the main avenues. Senator Rasmussen, any follow-up? Right. Any further discussion? Representative Nadeau. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I think this was done before I got here, and I don't think I've decided whether or not I agree or disagree with this incentive on getting these local plans into a state pension plan, but I want to talk about the costs. Um, who pays for the costs of these plans now coming into PARA? Are the volunteer organizations paying for those costs? Are PARA members? Who, who's covering those costs? And maybe at 235 plans now and maybe it's, an, in, maybe it's not important, maybe it's just something that's lost, but what happens if 100% come in? Um, who pays? Who pays to administer these these funds? Mr. Anderson, uh, Madam Chair, Representative Doe, it does come from the plans themselves. They pay an administrative fee to Para, uh, which will be sixty dollars per member uh, starting in this next year. They also pay a fee for to SBI, uh, which is uh, I think six cents per hundred thousand dollars. It's dirt cheap, whatever. It's a very good, uh, very good value. Uh, but this is, these are costs that are um, assessed directly to the funds, to each of the individual plans that they pay. Representative Nadeau. Just so I'm clear, so they are bearing the cost of administrating these plans. Okay. Thank you, Madam Chair. Representative O'Driscoll. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, yeah, we have been discussing this topic for um, a number of years in front of the Commission. And I've always maintained that it doesn't need to be compulsory that every plan needs to participate. It's an option for the local relief associations. Um, some of the relief associations um, have pro professional expertise within their ranks and are comfortable with the locals making those investments and being able to have eye-to-eye and knee-to-knee contact with the, with the members of the relief association and work really well at the local level. I agree that there may be some that don't want to be in the business or it is a financial burden for them because resources aren't available. So I'm always open to options, but I will never support a compulsory requirement that every relief association be turned over to PARA for the management of those benefits. Um, again, the locals are the ones who have the skin in the game. And they. Um, what I've learned over the years is people like to be able to see their money or see someone who can see their money and they feel a little bit better about that as time goes on. One other question for um, Director Anderson. Um, with the PERA uh, management option, is there an annuitization option that's available for members um, through PERA if they do participate in this plan? Director Anderson. Uh, Madam Chair, Representative O'Driscoll, there is an annuitization option that I'm not aware has ever been elected by any member. Representative O'Driscoll, any follow-up? Thank you. Uh, Senator Friends. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thanks for bringing this forward. Thank you, Director Anderson. To Representative O'Driscoll's point, I think in the years we've been discussing this, part of our hope is that individual firefighters around the state and through their local plans will have the discussion about the rate of return. Mm -hmm. And so to your point, Director Anderson, about dirt cheap, one of the reasons, of course, those rates of return tend to look pretty good is when you lower the expenses. And so just... Uh, count me in as one voice to say I'm, I'm glad it's still optional, but I, I think we want to make sure everybody knows, okay, here's the potential advantages on the rate of return, which in the end goes to these members and their families and plan participants. And we had some questions a couple of years ago, does everybody know that? And when you take it local and keep it local, that's a choice you get to make. But is it true that you did that in light of the potential rate of return benefit, which of course is increased, Madam Chair, every time you lower the expenses? especially when you lower them to the legendary dirt cheap level. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Senator Friends. Uh, Representative O'Driscoll. Madam Chair, to Senator Friends' point, um, I, I think that information is good, let, leaving options out there for the relief associations to look at and to evaluate makes sense. 
but I also can tell you that um, the relief associations I'm familiar with also have professional management of these. And when you start putting these into larger plans like this, um, the private sector does have some products that are available that help keep expenses relatively low because they're pooling large sums of money, not just within the relief association, not just within the state, but across the country as well for these very same kinds of purposes. Thank you, members, for the discussion. And um, Mr. Anderson, do you have any final comments before we move uh, forward? No, I do not, Madam Chair. Thank, Thank you. you for your presentation today. Finally, we will hear a bill regarding eligibility of certain firefighter mm -hmm. positions within the para PNF plan from Representative Berg and Senator Nelson. I will invite Representative Berg and Senator Nelson uh, to up to the testifier table now. And I understand that Representative Berg will make the motion to move, and Senator Nelson has uh, comments after that. Is that correct? Yeah. Oh, I can make the motion. Okay. Um, um, Madam Chair, um, I would move. Um, oh, I see you've lost it here. Uh, the language coded reviser 2407097 be recommended to pass and be incorporated into the omnibus pension and retirement bill. Um, I, I did want to make uh, just a, a few opening comments. Uh, please uh, move forward with your opening comments. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. <clears throat> well, first, I think it's uh, timely that we're here today uh, discussing fire, and I want to uh, thank the committee uh, for its focus today. Um, I think we're here with heavy hearts, and uh, as I see our, um, our protectors with their badges covered, we always think about about that, and I'm particularly thinking about uh, the 2001 John Marshall graduate, uh, who was um, Adam Finseth, who uh, was shot in that uh, firefight uh, in Burnsville. Um, and to the point today, uh, just note that uh, para police and fire is a plan reserved for people whose full-time jobs take on danger and risk to protect the public. Uh, under current law, not all of these full-time fire positions are eligible for para, police and fire. I think perhaps uh, uh, Senator Rasmussen re uh, referred to that. Uh, this uh, bill before you today would allow fire marshals, assistant fire marshals, battalion chiefs, assistant chiefs, and deputy chiefs to be eligible for para, P uh, police, and fire. And I think the key point to remember is that some of these people are already in police and fire due to a prior role within their department. Many who are hired externally and perform firefighting duties at another city or state are not allowed in para-police and fire, even though they're performing the same <coughs> roles as their colleagues. So changing this law would ensure that people have the same, who have same or similar positions are being treated equitably, and it would also help with recruitment. So uh, that's uh, the overall uh, rationale behind this bill, uh, Madam Chair. Thank you, Senator Nelson. Representative Burke, did you have any other comments to add? Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I'll reserve my comments for the closing. Thank you. Um, I will now turn it to our nonpartisan staff for, like, for an explanation of the bill. Uh, LCPR Director uh, Sean Kelly, if you could please proceed with the explanation. Thank you, Chair Her and members of the Commission. Um, please see the staff memo in your materials, which summarizes the bill and provides a brief overview of the eligibility requirements for the para police and fire plan. The bill modifies the eligibility requirements for the police and fire plan to include, include certain employees that work in fire service that are not currently included in the plan. This bill is before the commission today because fire chiefs and other stakeholders have expressed that the eligibility requirements uh, for the PNF plan as currently interpreted are too narrow and do not permit employees working in positions such as fire marshal or assistant fire chief to uh, join the plan. The bill modifies the eligibility requirements to address these concerns. The rest of my summary will be a brief section by section review of the bill. Section one modifies the eligibility requirements for full-time employees working in fire service. The key distinctions between the current statutory requirements and the new requirements under the bill are that the new requirements include supervisors of firefighters, allowing positions such as assistant fire chief to be eligible. Um, the new requirements recognize job duties that exist within fire service in addition to firefighting 
including fire suppression, uh, prevention, or investigation. And rather than um, stating the employee is engaged in the hazards of fight, firefighting, um, the new requirements now state that the employee is exposed to um, the hazards of firefighting, the other job duties previously mentioned, um, which allows positions such as fire marshal to be included. Um, section two uh, modifies the provision related to eligibility for part-time employees by making clarifying changes. Section three adds a new paragraph to a subdivision. Uh, the subdivision requires that a governing body, such as a city council, um, that adopts a resolution declaring that a position is eligible for the police and fire plan um, to file the resolution with PARA. The new paragraph um, requires that PARA consider the resolution from the governing body as sufficient evidence that the employee meets the eligibility requirements. Section four um, changes the process that allows a member in the police and fire plan that changes positions in the same department to remain in the plan if the governing body sends a copy of the resolution to PARA. Under the bill, a member will now be able to transfer to a new job um, in another fire department in the state of Minnesota and remain in the plan. Section five that um, states that all sections are effective the day following final enactment. Um, Chair Her, that concludes my review. Thank you. Thank you, Deputy Director uh, Kelly. Um, we do have three testifiers here today, and so I will call you up, uh, and if you could just then identify yourself <coughs> for the record and begin. So I have Deputy Chief Holly Mulholland, Rochester Fire Department. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee. My name is Holly Mulholland. I'm the Deputy Chief of the Rochester Fire Department. Thank you for this opportunity to testify in support of this bill that will revise eligibility into the Para Police and Fire Plan. I also like to thank Senator Nelson and Representative Berg for carrying this legislation. This bill will clarify who is eligible to be enrolled in the Para Police and Fire Plan. As things stand now, not all fire marshals, assistant fire marshals, battalion chiefs, assistant chiefs, and deputy chiefs are eligible for the Para Police and Fire Plan. In order for a member of a fire department to be eligible, the primary duties of a person's position must include extinguishing fires. However, there are many positions within a fire department that perform hazardous duties as their primary role, whether commanding um, fire resources on incident scenes uh, or uh, conducting fire origin and cause determinations within a structurally compromised building containing well-known carcinogens. Furthermore, some fire departments have employees with the same job titles and job descriptions in the para police and fire plan and others who are not. The only thing that differentiates them is that some were previously firefighters in that jurisdiction. Those hired externally doing the same job are not eligible to be enrolled in the para police and fire plan. These significant differences in benefits for the same job make recruitment challenging. In Rochester, we've seen firsthand how employees doing the same job are treated differently from their colleagues as it relates to eligibility in the para police and fire plan. We currently have two assistant fire marshals and one fire marshal that differ in eligibility to enroll. One assistant fire marshal is in the para police and fire plan because he was a firefighter in the Rochester Fire Department, while the other assistant fire marshal and the fire marshal who supervises both of the assistant fire marshals were hired externally and are not in the para police and fire plan. We are asking the legislature to clarify that the previously mentioned fire positions are eligible to be enrolled in the para police and fire plan, regardless of whether they were transferred within the department or hired externally. If they routinely respond to fire emergencies to support the firefighting efforts and are exposed to the risks and hazards of a fire scene. Again, I thank the Legislative Commission on Pensions and Retirement for considering this bill it will not affect a large number of individuals, but it will make a significant impact on those it does affect, and it will aid the Minnesota Fire Service in the <coughs> recruitment of these positions. I would be happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you, Deputy Chief Mulholland. We'll uh, finish the testimony, and if you could all remain up there for questions. Uh, up next is Chief Eric Bullen, Albertville Fire Department, and President of the Minnesota State Fire Chiefs Association. Thank you, Madam Chair. I can't do any better than that, so I'll do my best. <clears throat> she was nervous too, I think. I'm not sure how that went. Um, first, I want to thank Senator Nelson and Representative Berg for offering to carry this legislation forward. Thank you to the LCPR staff, both Ms. Lincheski and Mr. Kelly, for their work on this. 
and to Pair Executive Director Anderson and his staff for helping us with these issues. Our Legislative Chair, Chief Jungman, is obviously tied up in, due to the tragic events that occurred in Burnsville this week. He had started and done the heavy, lift, heavy lifting with Para and the initial discussions surrounding these issues, and I'll do the best I can to add to the discussion. Prior to this legislative session, this item was identified by the Minnesota Fire Association Coalition, which is the state chiefs, the State Department Association, the Minnesota Arson Investigators, and the Fire Marshals Association as one of our top legislative priorities. And work with LCPR staff and PARA resulted in the requested legislative change you see before you today. <clears throat> this update to PARA PNF language is critical to helping employees who hold the same job title and have the same duties finally benefiting from the matching retirement plans. Also bringing all those who perform fire suppression, fire investigation, and fire prevention under the same umbrella. As the command staffs across the state age, present company excluded, and new positions open, correcting this language now is critical to fire departments being able to recruit the best and the brightest to fill these open positions, regardless of if they come from internal or external organizations. And I'll, re I'll repeat what Chief Mulholland said. Thank you for your attention to something that will affect a smaller number of pair of PNF employees, but to those employees, this will make a significant impact. Thank you. Thank you, Chief Bowen. And then our last testifier is uh, Director uh, Doug Anderson from PARA. Morning, Madam Chair. Uh, Doug Anderson, Executive Director for PARA. Uh, PARA staff appreciates the opportunity to collaborate with stakeholders on this issue, uh, and PARA's board does support the bill. Thank you, Mr. Anderson. Uh, members, any questions or comments? Representative O'Driscoll. Thank you, Madam Chair, and um, to Director Anderson. Um, there is a differential in the amount of employer and employee contribution um, that comes on this. Can you review for the commission where the um, backfilling would come from for uh, making these individuals vested and eligible from PRA general to the PERA police and fire, that difference in funding for both the local municipality as well as the um, individual firefighter and or candidate that this, is con this legislation is considering? Director Anderson. Uh, Madam Chair, Representative O'Driscoll, uh, under the PARA general plan, the employee contribution is 6.5%. Under the PNF plan, it's 10.8%. And on the employer contribution in the general plan, it's 7.5% and 17.7% in the PNF plan. Representative O'Driscoll. Thank you, Madam Chair. And Director Anderson, to that point, where's the difference going to come from to keep the plan whole? Um, I, I support the idea, don't get me wrong. I'm just kind of also on the backside of the napkin going, okay, PNF is uh, in some difficult um, funding. It's not where we want it to be. This doesn't help if there is no uh, additional funding that comes in, but yet there's more demand and benefits on the, the retirement side on this. So just looking to see how we can keep the plan whole to preserve benefits for all members who are entitled to benefits. Director Anderson. Yeah, Madam Chair, Representative O'Driscoll. So the, there, there would be in, in the police and fire plan, there is additional liability for these members that come in, uh, but there's also the additional funding from the contributions, which currently is uh, more at a higher level than the benefits that are accrued. So the, the funding level, uh, because uh, member contributions and employer contributions are helping to pay the unfunded liability, the addition of members is actually adding more funding to the plan than the cost of the benefit level. That funding would come from members and from the employer. Representative O'Driscoll. So Madam Chair, I don't know if I completely followed the explanation. I guess I'll just ask it this way. Do we have a, a, a confidence level that um, adopting this plan and the uh, funding sources that you're, you've outlined, we are not going to uh, further increase the liabilities of the plan as a result of this, this uh, proposed plan change? Director Anderson. Uh, Madam Chair, Representative O'Driscoll, so the, the liability does increase because it's adding benefit, but also the contributions are increasing at a higher level. So this would... Uh, on a net impact actually probably be favorable to the fund. Representative O'Driscoll. Thought I had it, but now I'm not sure. So if I could, Director Anderson, if someone has been on the job, um, as was stated by Deputy Chief, um, Mulhand, 
you know, somebody might have been, these. this is my example, not hers, but somebody might have been an assistant fire marshal for five years. They've been paying at PRA general. The reclassification gets them to P&F. How do we backfill those five years to provide them the full benefit of the service then with that? If I heard you say we're going to continue to receive contributions, I understand that on a prospective basis. But what about the backfill to be able to make that person fully eligible in the fund um, able to offset the liability of the increase in benefits that would be paid. And maybe uh, to add to Representative O'Driscoll's point here is that are we starting a member new as they enter, as they're eligible, even if they've been here for a number of years, or are we actually uh, buying in the years that they might have missed uh, in order to get them caught up? So maybe that might be the clarifying question here. Uh, uh, Director Anderson. Uh, uh, Madam Chair, Representative O'Driscoll, it's a good question. My, my understanding is that this is a prospective coverage and, and not retrospective. And maybe we can have um, Deputy Director Kelly, do you, do you know that through the legislation, if you could provide clarification? Yeah, um, yeah. Director Lincheski. Yeah, it is prospectus, prospective. So it, there is no allowance right now for some additional payments from the employer and the employee to give them past service credit. It's as if they're starting as a new member in PNF. Representative O'Driscoll. Hate to do it, but it's gotta be asked. So then would those individuals then be uh, eligible for a combined service annuity, what they did at the uh, general level and what they were doing at the PNF because of the proposed change in this legislation? Uh, Director Anderson, do you know this answer? Or do you... uh, Madam Chair, I do not. Director Lincheski or Deputy Director Kelly? Yeah, Chair Hurst, um, that, that is an issue that needs to be looked at. Um, under CSA, you need to start your annuity within a 12-month period. So if someone retired at 55 under PNF, but then retired at 65 under uh, the para-general plan, they're, they're, those wouldn't match up and you wouldn't be able to do the CSA. So. There's probably more work to be done on that issue. Um, but yeah, that's where we are. Thank you uh, for the discussion. And um, I think that then based on uh, the current language, then once this is effective, if somebody is eligible, they join as of that date. There is no past history or no ways of catching them up. But that could be a future discussion that we could have. Is that correct, Director Lincheski? OK. Uh, any further discussion? Oh, I see uh, Representative Nadeau and then Senator Howe. Thank you, Madam Chair. And my question was very similar to that. My example was going to be bringing in someone from another state, from another area. Is how how are you going to how are we going to backfill that? Um, how are we going to backfill it from a, another 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 region? Um, how 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 would we how would we bring parity to that? If they come in, they've been you know in a in a different pension plan. Um, and then all of a sudden, we're going to put them in this one, and they work for five years. They work the last five years of their career as a as a fire marshal. Um, would they be eligible for a full for a full police and fire benefit at that point under this? Uh, Rep, um, Director Anderson, does that question seem clear to you, uh, Madam Chair? I believe uh, so. I, uh, uh, Representative Nadeau, if I understand correctly, so uh, if someone comes from another state, there's no transfer of service, uh, either for vesting purposes or benefit purposes. So they're essentially uh, being uh, entering as a new entrant. Uh, and then they would need to have five years of service to become partially vested, 50% vested after five years, and fully vested after 10 years. Representative Nadeau. Um, OK, and thank you. So I, I know that we're going to do some more um, some more work on this. So, I, and again, I, I I support this. I think this is a I think this is a good move in the right direction. Um, I just hope we work through some of the Im implementation things on this before it before it kind of comes back and it's ready to pass. So, thank you, thank you, Madam Chair. Senator Howe. Well, thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, is I guess my question is: Are all these folks that are going to be brought in going to be licensed as as Firefighters, and they're actually going to have that qualification, or are they going to be in a different capacity? I mean, are they all? Because not all fire marshals and and uh, assistant fire marshals 
are actually certified as firefighters. They have not gone, th from my understanding, they have not all gone through the training. So uh, is that going to be a, a requirement in the statute? Um, maybe the two fire chiefs. I don't know if you could answer Senator Howe's question. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Senator Howe, that's a good question. On the, on the firefighter side, <clears throat> anyone employed by a full-time fire department has to be licensed by the MBFTE. That's a good question for the, for the fire marshal side. Uh, Senator Howe. Well, well, thank you. And I, I kind of resemble this whole thing because uh, I moved from, the, uh, from a firefighter into the fire marshal's office. Uh, but in our department, the fire marshal was required to respond to fires. We were the backup crew. We did the investigations. And I completely agree that any investigator uh, needs to be covered, should be covered under this plan. But we also, in my... In, the, in our office had folks that were inspectors. Uh, they were assistant fire marshals by title, but they never responded to fires. They never did the investigations. And so we're never really exposed to those hazards. So to me, those definitions are quite, they, they, to me, they have to be different and uh, as far as qualifying for. Uh, and then I, I actually moved out of a, career department into a place where I was a building official slash fire marshal, but I wouldn't go unless my pension followed me. So what the city council did was make me their first and only full-time firefighter to when a call came in, I responded, qualifying me. And I don't understand why if the city wants them to be in that fund, why they just couldn't do that memo today and say because they respond to or investigate those items, they couldn't now be in the plan. So I'm trying to understand the need for this if the city would just go ahead and say that they respond to these calls and are considered a firefighter, that they wouldn't fit in the plan today. Uh, Chief. I don't know if you can answer that question. Yeah, Madam Chair, Senator Hall, maybe some clarification for my first answer. Especially if there's movement inside the fire department, right? Someone's a firefighter, they, they, they begin in Rochester, they progress up the ranks. Um, some, of the, some of the stuff we talked to Pear about was just um, having language in your job descriptions, right? Some of that's the approval of the municipality saying, yes, this person does these, these duties as you described. Um, so for the arson investigators, they are working post-fire investigations in contaminated areas. They're exposed to the same carcinogens. So just the fact that they're not there when the fire is actually burning, sometimes they're exposed more because their level of personal protective equipment isn't the same that the structural firefighters are using at the time. So if they're in that department and, and, the, and they come up as firefighter and move to a certain level and then branch off from the fire marshal's office, they're most likely, based on the job description, are still covered under those, those requirements by the, by the MBFT for licensing. So clarification on my answer for the first part, if that answers your question a little better. Senator Howe. Oh, thank you. And, and so, as, and I'm, I'm not saying I'm not supportive, but I do have concerns that we're going to open this up a little bit further than what I think needs to be. I think we still need to narrow a scope, and, and I sometimes believe that if the city would just do the right thing and write it in the job description or provide the letter that says they're eligible because they respond to these types of situations, I don't know if we need the legislation. Uh, some of this stuff makes sense. Some of this stuff, I think, is probably a little too much encompassing for me to understand right now, and I need to ask more questions and get clarifications. Senator Nelson. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I, I believe... Uh, Chief Holland can answer that. And while she's coming, I would ask also um, uh, staff to look at lines 1.18 uh, through 20 as we're looking at that section one, subdivision one. It sounds to me like they must be licensed, like we've already covered that in the legislation here. They must be licensed, but I'm looking for some confirmation elsewhere. Uh, Chief Mulholland. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, one thing I did want to add, um, uh, to add on to something Chief Bowen said and um, to Senator Howe, um, 
there, there are those processes, um, uh, as the example that Senator Howe gave. The, the challenge where that uh, plays is recruitment. Um, as a candidate considering moving, um, you have to rely on the, the potential for the municipality that you're considering to go, on, to go through that resolution process. And so as we look at these um, present company excluded, our leadership um, aging, and really being able to competitively recruit for those positions around the state, um, this uh, clarifying legislation would make, take that uncertainty away. Thank you, uh, Chief Mulholland. And staff, did you um, have any comments on Senator Nelson's uh, uh, asking for review of 1.18 and that it already states they're licensed? You can confirm that. Yeah, to her, thank you. And Senator Nelson, you are correct. I think something happened with this language when it went up to the revisor's office. So I think we can bring it back and see what our original language was and make sure that it takes care of the issue that you and Senator Howard are bringing up here. Thank you. And I think I saw Representative O'Driscoll's hand up again. Do you? Yes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Just two other things. Um, to the topic right now, um, in lines 1.17 1 1 through 1.12, um, it looks like the municipality has the ability to write the job description for the fire marshal, the assistant fire marshal, and they can choose whether they want to have as a requirement them to be fire certified for response or not. And to Senator Hall's point, I think that that um, just kind of parses at one more level where what's, what's the community's need, what's the community's goal on that, and that, that may, may solve the problem and it may not, um, the way that the, that legislation is proposed in the bill. The other thing that I want to just pr pursue with, um, um, or excuse me, with Director Anderson, um, and if he's not the appropriate person, we can certainly find that person. But a number of years ago, by a number of years ago, I mean more than this biennium and beyond, we had some discussions about um, certain um, firefighters and others being able to purchase back uh, military service. Mm -hmm. And I would like to know how that purchase of military service um, would link up with this proposed legislation because someone could be in the um, prospective part of this, come back and want to buy that, that service, mm -hmm which was prior to the prospective on here. How does that balance out? Is it when it's purchased or is it when that service was earned? Um, just would like to have some clarification on that as well. Because these are questions that will eventually find themselves in front of this commission. So the more we can anticipate those and have answers, the less, the less um, uncertainty and, and work we'll have to do in the future as a result of addressing some of those topics today. Director Anderson. <clears throat> Um, Madam, Madam Chair, Representative Driscoll, that's a, a good question. I don't have a, a good answer at the moment about that. We'd have to look closer at that. Thank you. Is there any further discussion? Um, and I really appreciate the uh, the commission diving deep into the language. I think that um, this makes it with, um, makes it so that we can uh, bring forward the best language. And I know that the motion initially was to uh, recommend to pass and be incorporated. But if the two authors are OK with this, with the number of questions that we have, we want to make sure we get this right, that maybe we lay this over for possible inclusion. So that gives us a little bit of time to work through this. Would the two of you be amendable to that? Yeah. Yes, Madam Chair. Yes, Madam Chair. Uh, wonderful. Then, uh, if, and then I can let the two of you make closing comments, and I can move it with the uh, new language if that's OK. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I want to thank everyone who has <clears throat> mentioned our community today, who has honored uh, Paramedic Finseth, uh, Officers Rugi and Elmstrand in their remarks and <clears throat> the broader uh, first responder community. Um, we are still reeling. We are trying to figure out what it looks like uh, moving forward in the days to come. And certainly when I agreed to author this bill, nobody had uh, any, any reason to think something like this would happen, but it has. And I think that we can all agree as we look around the room to the folks in uniform that these people do something every day that none of the rest of us would even have any understanding of. And um, for me, the reason that I wanted to be on this commission was to, to make sure that workers uh, 
when they're able to retire, um, have, have an opportunity to get what they deserved out of all their years of service, the legacy that they, that they built. And so I think uh, with all of that in mind, something like this bill um, just really focuses on the equity for the folks that have spent um, their career protecting us and, and um, making sure that we don't ever have to face anything they do. I did want to make a comment um, a little bit to, I believe, Senator House's um, question. Uh, so Senator Rasmussen and I spent uh, many months going around the state of Minnesota and we were on the bonding tour, um, our first shared um, biennium. And um, we saw many of these small town fire stations. Um, and we learned about how when, when the firefighters do come in and take their gear off and all the carcinogens and everything that is gathered into that, uh, get spread throughout these little tiny spaces, um, especially for the ones that don't have proper um, areas built into their facility to keep that from the rest of the people working in the building. So I think there are many little ways that all members of the fire departments uh, can be exposed and, and take risks. So uh, I just want to thank Senator Nelson and, and everybody else for your support, and especially for those of you here in uniform today. It means a lot to see you. Thank you. Chair. Thank you, Representative Byrd. And Senator Nelson? Yes, uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Representative Byrd, thank you for those uh, heartfelt comments. Um, I also want to thank the uh, Pension Commission for your in-depth study and, and insightful questions. I'm confident uh, that uh, we un all understand the reason why this is needed, and I'm very confident that we'll be able to go through and uh, tighten up that language to address your concern concerns and look forward to bringing it back before the commission, Madam Chair. Thank you, Senator Nelson, and I uh, just want to acknowledge I see uh, the will behind this commission to actually do right by our firefighters, and I look forward to all of us working on this language to ensure it comes back and it, it works best for everyone. And so the motion uh, before us uh, for language coded reviser 24-07097 be uh, laid over for possible inclusion into the omnibus pension and retirement bill. Okay. And uh, then because it's being laid over, we do not need to take a vote today, but thank you both very much for uh, presenting the bill. That concludes our business for today, members. Our next commission hearing will be on Monday, March 4th. We plan to consider legislation related to the correctional plans in MSRS and PARA. Seeing no uh, further business in front of this committee, this meeting is adjourned.